this is um, a talk on the hierarchy of heaven and earth by Douglas, and as was made very clear in the instructions for the gathering, you're all meant to have read it. <laughs> uh, so I'll assume that. And uh, Douglas wrote this uh, in the 40s, really, but he'd been working on it in the 30s. And it was published first in 1950, something like that. And he used to say that uh, later on, if you asked him about something, he'd say, oh, it's all in the hierarchy. And I first read it in 1976. I think I was the first person to read the big version. I couldn't believe it. I stayed at his house for two weeks, and blown away. And had the marvelous, marvelous opportunity to talk with him as I read it. You know, it was great. And uh, I've read it many times since. We've just done an online course on it. We published it, and it's being published into French uh, soon. And it is just an amazing book. And uh, every time I read it, lots of new things in it for me. And uh, I think it'll be one of those books, I really believe it will be one of the very great it stands on everyone's shoulders. So I'm going to just give you a, a little tour of some of the ideas. Uh, it starts out um, with a question, which is, who am I? What am I? And throughout the book, every so often, there's a kind of dialogue with common sense, philosophy and common sense. Because as he says, every argument, every thought, really is in contrast to its opposite. And there's this dialogue throughout the book between philosophy and common sense. And so the question is, who am I? And common sense says, you're a man. This is from a book I'm doing uh, with a friend. So this is meant to be Douglas, and this is common sense. So, uh, what am I? You're a man. But I'm not. I'm a headless body with the world on my shoulders. He's going for experience. He's putting aside for the moment what everyone has told him about himself. But then uh, his next thought is, all right, I'm headless, but I only have to look in a mirror and I find my head. Or I polish any surface and I'll find my head. Out there, as we've been doing the experiment today, so the, one first subsection is, you know, I've lost my head. The next section is the head found. And there's a region around you where you'll find your head. You hold your mirror out at arm's length and there it is. You look in a spoon and there it is, twisted slightly. And someone else over there on the right can see you. Out there at that range. So there's a zone where you keep your head, all the way around. For the people in front, it's facing you, and at centre you're nothing. You're at the centre, and others are looking at you, and so there's a region where you've got little heads, and a region where you've got big heads, and then either side, no head. From here, I see a little head, but I come up, and it gets bigger, gets bigger, bigger, and then... I lose it, or I come away and it shrinks. So there's this magical region around you where your head manifests for others and in the mirror, but at different sizes. Outer headless, inner headless. Sorry, what's the outer headless? Well, if I go far enough away from you, I no longer see your head. Right? Now, uh, he then says, okay, so when I enter this region around you, I get your head. But at the same time, you've entered the same region around me, so you get mine. I've got your appearance over here, and you've got mine over there. Common sense receives Douglas at his centre, Douglas receives common sense. So this is another way of thinking about it. Douglas was hot on diagrams. At the centre, you're nothing. <laughs> And this is a region around you, this magical region, where you appear as a person. 
your human region. So it says, you know, a certain distance away. But here comes the complication. Though you register my body there, you project it back on me here. So that means I get your body here, but actually you're not here, you're there. So I'm registering your head over here, and I say, actually it's there. Where is it? It's both here and there. This is where Douglas has a chapter called Projection and Reflection. Reflection is being like a mirror. You receive everything like a mirror here. But where is the here? It's not located anywhere. Everything that's located is in the mirror. And then you project it back out. So you see my face there, but you say it's here. But you come up to me and it, you don't find it here. And this is what Douglas calls the law of elsewhereness. You can't pin anything down. It's what uh, the philosophers at the beginning of the last century were working on uh, one aspect of philosophy influenced by relativity, the fallacy of simple location. That chair is not there, it's there from here. Mm. It's got a dual location between observer and observed. And this is a very profound thing, the law of elsewhereness. You've got three observers, those dots are outside observers, and you're at the center as nothing. But what this diagram means is that they see you out at those dots and they project you back. Now everyone sees a different you. And so the character at the middle is uh, adding up a, a composite. Now that's four views. This uh, is common sense looking at Douglas here, pointing at himself, and common sense has got a view. Now, you never see that view, but he's telling you, and he projects it on you, and you say, yeah, I'm Douglas, right? I'm a man. I'm a person. And in turn, you do the same to the other person. So it's a, a, a continual exchange. It's one system. You can't divide it up. Yeah, one system. Here's another way of putting it. I'm in you, you're in me. But the me that's in you is in me. So, this is the law of elsewhere. You can't say, I'm just here. I'm here from there, and there is there from here. You can't be pinned down. <coughs> If anyone comes up to you, they, they lose you. And, they, and if they stand in your place where you're not and look out, they see you've gone there because you're out there now. But they go there and you've gone. You're somewhere else. So it's like a great big game of hide and seek. You come to find me and I've gone. I'm over there. And then he says, uh, you know, so we, in a way we never meet. We're always out. Except we more than meet because we become each other. So I live both at this empty centre looking out at others and out there looking back. You, you're in both places. So I'm just here, but where's here? Here is everywhere. This is a fundamental thing in the hierarchy, is this ability to shift centre. See yourself from outside, be others. Because your centre is not located anywhere, so it's everywhere. It's every centre. Okay, so we're back to reflection here. So you reflect a whole load of objects, the, the objects in the room now, whatever you're looking at, you receive like a mirror. But then you re project them back out and you project them to different layers. So people, you project to this region and then the building further and then the clouds further and stars even further. So although the world is flat, it's deep. There's another way of thinking about it, or the same thing really, 
is you're here and you project to there at different ranges. Picture on the right more or less relates to the diagram, right? Mm. The body is close, the person is further, the house is further, the, finally the sun. Your world is layered. And uh, of course, if we now look at the model, here we are. Your view out is layered. This is from the center out. This is the, the, one of the diagrams connected with this kind of thing. So, very close region, then further and further. Okay, so, think first about the one on the left. Because you're nothing, when you project something, you go with it. It's not like you're here projecting there. There's nothing left. You go with it. To the furthest galaxy. You travel with it. And then you turn around and look back. So, here, we're pointing at Andromeda. Now we've moved center to Andromeda, and all these stars are part of the galaxy of Andromeda, looking back at our galaxy. So, just so you're clear... Uh, a galaxy is a whole load of stars. And uh, to look at another galaxy, you've got to look from somewhere. You're not just floating in space. This here is a planet within a star in this galaxy. So up to here is very local. This is part of this galaxy, and then you're looking across at another one. I don't get that. When I'm looking at you, Carol, I'm looking from this person to that person, if you like. Okay. And I can see a part of this person, my hand, and then beyond I see the whole of yours. So you always look out from some place through a bit of this bit to see the whole of that one. Right? So you're seeing a bit of Carol, and you're seeing the whole of Richard. I don't get that. Okay. When you're looking at another planet, you're looking from this planet. So yeah. you see a bit of this planet, right? So you know you can't see the whole, it's disappearing in the void, this planet, and you're room for that planet. When you look at a, a, a star, you can't see this star at night. You see the others, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But you see a bit of this star. The planet is part of this star. So it's like seeing your nose. So you're looking out past the bits of this star, this planet, and maybe you see Venus, that's like a bit of your arm. Beyond, way to the next star. It's the same at every level. So now, you're on a star here. And this star is part of a galaxy. So now you look, you're looking through this bit of the galaxy that you can see. That's another one. So far, Douglas has described what he is in terms of his own point of view. I am headless and... I'm surrounded by a layer of heads, and then I look further, and the, the view out is many leveled. And the common sense says, yeah, but who cares about your view out? It's irrelevant what you're looking at. It's what you look like that is you. I said, oh, okay. But which angle is me? Why pick just the front? <laughs> <laughs> They're all views of you at that range. But why restrict your view to one range? Why not move further away? Now we're on the outside of the model. You know, if you're saying, well, you're what you look like, why stick to that? You're all of them closer and further away. You need all of them. We're familiar with that idea, right? We need every one of them. We're not just human. Our view out is many levels. The view in is many levels. Everyone on board? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here's another way of representing it in that familiar diagram. This is what you look like. It's my galaxy. Well, it's say, my person, my species, my geosphere, life, planet, my cells. Although we don't see them directly, we identify with them. So you're taking up another view and taking on board that view of you. Just have a look at that. The observer's view in reveals my head, my body, my planet. My view out, other heads, other bodies, other planets, etc. 
If you combine these views, we now have mutual observers who always have equal stages. This is the diagram that Douglas drew, so I'll explain it in a bit more detail. When I'm in your star region, you're in mine. When I'm in your human region, you're in mine. It's called the law of equality. Okay, so, if you put a mirror up in the sky... Hang on a minute. Do you mean you, meaning us, or do you mean an observer in the planet? For example? Well, you're looking from your empty centre, and I'm looking from my empty centre. Yes. And my empty centre appears in you as a person. And your empty centre appears in me as a person. So it's equal because we're mutual, it's equal range, right? But if I'm on Saturn... If you're on Saturn, your empty centre is there and you appear to me as Saturn. Now at that range, my empty centre would appear to you as a similar celestial body. So if the observer is project what is out there where it sees me as... Yes. So you're not talking about your audience in this room? Only that at this range we are human for each other. Yes. And the mirror confirms this, because it's at this range a mirror receives your humanity. If you could put mirrors further away, you would see these other layers of your body. <laughs> but you can't see mirrors in the heavens. No. All our looking is as if in a mirror. So this is what we do when we look at someone else. They're like a mirror that tells you that you're human. Mm -hmm. Now when you look at this star, it's telling you you're a star. Mm -hmm. You look at a, a planet, it's saying you're a planet. This is very, uh, a very profoundly different way of seeing ourselves. So, you're looking out at the stars. Where are you looking from? This star. Well, nothing. And this, you're in a star here. You mm. can't see it. You've voided it. You don't, and this star is empty for those. Just as when you look at me, you don't see you, but I reflect your humanity back to you. So you're both a person and you're nothing that's room for Richard. When you look further, now you, do, you not only don't see your human face, you don't see your star face. And this empty star face is full of all these beings. And it's only lack of imagination not to be able to place yourself out there in those stars and see yourself. So, we're getting the, this sense that yourself is elastic, right? Mm. Because I see a man there, I'm a man here. But what is it to be a, a man? It's to contain other beings, cells which contain molecules. Now, each level has its kind of uh, selfhood. But when I look at you, I say, I as Richard see you. I don't say, the cells in my eyes see you. <laughs> right? It's all my cells all together build up into one being that says, I see you. I need all these inner layers. But to be a man is not to be a man, a person, but to be room for others. This is a law of elsewhereness. You can't pin yourself down. And you could put yourself right now in his position and you'd see Douglas. Right? Mm -hmm. You are raised to the status of the object you accommodate. If I accommodate a human, I'm human. If I just look up and accommodate a star, I expand it to be a star. To be the earth is to contain other levels. The layers are life, and uh, then uh, humanity, and individuals, and cells. Just as when you look at a person, you don't say it's the cells, these cells seeing a person, it's me as a person sees a person. 
So now when you look at the planet, it isn't quite right to say, I as Richard see the planet. I need my whole planetary body to see that, just as I need my whole human body to see you. So you're, you see with your whole body, you need your whole planet to see the other planet. Here we have, instead of humans exchanging appearances, planets. Mars is in me and I'm in Mars. I go to Mars and turn around and I am Earth. Or, look out at Andromeda, look back from Andromeda, it's not Richard, it's the Milky Way. Okay, so, Douglas first takes this overview. He has given us the law of elsewhereness, go up to anything, it's not there, it's somewhere else, you can't pin yourself down. He's given us the law of equality, whatever I look at gives me an equal status, I change the object I'm looking at, my status changes. A few other things, and then he is asking the question, who am I? So first then, from there, he goes in. And he looks within himself. And uh, here's a hierarchical pyramid picture. He's made of cells, cells are made of molecules, at, right? Another way of thinking about it. This is distance as much as anything, right? of the observer, the range of the observer. Through the other, you are looking into yourself. And uh, just like if you human cells that he drew, he, you know, there's a, in a big house, huge amount on the uh, life of cells. The way to see a cell is to look through a microscope, say. So you as the observer, through the instrument, are placing yourself even closer to another object and it reveals itself as cells. What you are doing is you are placing yourself in the cellular region of that nothingness. Mm. It appears in you as a cell. You would appear to it as a cell. If you... It's a mutual range. Mm. Now we have, in the movement of the observer towards your center, we have what we call a vertical movement. Horizontal movement is when you're going around the person and seeing them from different angles. Vertical is when you move from one layer to the next. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the real life that happens is vertical. In other words, my humanity continually refers inwards to my cells, and my cells are continually referring outwards to my humanity. So I eat something, and it turns, the cells deal with it. But then that doesn't end there, the molecules, you know. The, the real exchange is going on in this direction. So, uh, this is introducing this vertical go of things, which is the way the whole thing kind of works. So, mapping out these layers, you see, most science, sciences are study one layer. Chemistry, or physics, <laughs> or geography, or astronomy, human sciences. So what Douglas is now doing in this book is he's put it all together as one organism. Mm. And he's going to study the whole organism together to see how the whole thing works. That hasn't been done before in this way. Mm. It's, a, it's a fantastic thing. So the vertical go of things, how one layer turns into next or affects the next or from the center how things emerge. Then he goes closer, we've got molecules. So you're moving closer with your instruments. Again, you, it's, uh, it's so deep. The law of elsewhere operates here. Say back on the cellular level, when you're looking at a cell, you've placed yourself with a microscope very close. But you're not just there, you're also at the human end. You're in two places. So you look into the cellular region from the human. So, if you don't understand that, read the hierarchy. <laughs> <laughs> now he comes even closer, deep within himself. And this is uh, you know, one of those diagrams that gives a sense of the wave-like indeterminate location of electrons. So you can't play, you know, say where it is at any one moment in time with that and so on. Anyway, here's a more diagrammatic, less accurate, I suppose, but it serves a purpose. So, here's the nucleus and here are surrounding electrons. 
So Douglas then says, look, you can place yourself in any position. You can place yourself in the location of an electron viewing the nucleus, and you can place yourself in the nucleus. In other words, this doesn't just happen nowhere. It's being observed. And if you're a you know, physicist down at this level, you, to understand it, you're placing yourself in imagination or through your instruments. You've got to use your imagination here. Mm -hmm. This is... Uh, what Douglas calls a projective reflective couple. So in other words, if I'm looking at you, Robin, I'm reflecting you, but I project you back. But you reflect me, and you project me back. And it's a two-way thing. So I am nothing viewing you there, but I know you're nothing viewing me there, but we exchange this information all the time. Coming closer, you're always nothing, being seen as something. At a very, very close level, you are observable as the nucleus of an atom. What would the observer look like to see you? You've got to imagine it. There you are. You're nothing. The field is always the same size. There's an electron. Whoa. Observing it. The electron is moving through your field, around you. But now you place yourself in the position of the electron. So the nucleus is like the sun. And the electron is like a planet going round. So from our point of view, the electron going round the nucleus, we're not moving, the sun's moving, right? Mm -hmm. But place yourself where the sun is at the nucleus, you won't see the sun, you see the planets going by. It's the same at every level. And uh, the field is always the same size as something else it goes in, to, and things uh, grow, but never, can never go beyond the size of the field. Now, if this is uh, observer receding, so the observer's going away from you. So let's think of it as a planet at the top. And when you move away, you get the other planets coming into the view and maybe the sun. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. You move even further away and they get even smaller in the field. The thing at the top is the constant field. So within the field, you've got very small planets and sun, and finally they all come together into a star. Mm -hmm. Why is it a constant field if it's nowhere? Your, your view now, how big is it? You can't say, can you? No. No, because it, so it, it, everything shrinks and grows within this field. Right? If, if I came up to you, I'd get bigger and bigger and bigger, but then I wouldn't continue growing outside the field, would I? You'd finally see cells. If I'm going away from you, yeah. you see I get smaller and smaller, you see other people coming into the view, right? And then you go further and further away and uh, they become dots in the landscape, say you're going up above, and finally you don't see people anymore, you see a city. So what, what is constant? Well, you, the whole field has no uh, reference point to another, you can't say it's big or small, right? Your field okay. of view, yeah. right. So you could say it's just constant. Does it, how can it expand if there's nowhere for it to expand? Right? Yeah. Okay, so in that sense, hey, I mean, how many people have really taken that seriously? That's, that's you know, scientific experiment. How big is the field? All right. Okay, so uh, that is receding. So as you move away, you move to a higher level of self. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. This is synthesis. This is rising up the hierarchy. That's the other way. This is now approaching. There's the, say, the star. As you go up, it gets bigger and bigger. Then it breaks apart into planets and sun. And you go up to one of those, there you are, and now you've got the Earth, the next lower level. Perhaps you should explain that when you use the word star, you mean the solar system, don't you? You're, you're, yes. The solar system, which is the star and its, and its planets. Yes, but at a level, at a, at a far level, enough away, it's one it. object. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's right. So, this is the vertical movement again. So, you can be moving around an object, or you can move in away and closer. That's the vertical movement. So, Douglas has gone in to closer and closer. He's asking the question, who am I? And modern physics says, you can't say what an object is intrinsically. It is an appearance. It is mm -hmm. a, an effect that mm -hmm. you register at a distance.
So the question when you're asking who am I is what's right at the center? But the physicist said, well, you know, it looks like nothing, but how can we know? Well, you're at the center and you look and you confirm it's nothing. And then there's a whole chapter on that and how, you know, the amazing uh, uh, place that is from which everything emerges and into which everything returns and all that kind of stuff. So then we move out because that's only the inward journey. So now we're moving out. We're still asking the question, who am I? And when you move away now from, eventually you get to the city. You don't see people at this level, right? People don't exist at this level. You have, it's a memory, but you, the memory of a closer stage. And cities grow. They, Douglas has the whole thing about each level is alive but has its own qualities. This is London through the centuries growing. And this is, I think, a king or something. I am the state. You identify with your city. You identify with your country. And here's an image for humanity. which is just showing that it's not separate from the environment. We aren't. And now this is moving further away into the biosphere. These are images that just show this kind of movement away that includes more. And if you go back in time, we connect with the whole of life. This hawk moth makes no sense without the flower. It's grown that thing to reach into the flower. It's, not, it's one system. Now we move even further away to the level of the planet, the living Earth. This is again this projection and reflection thing. So I'm nothing at the center, I appear there as the Earth, but the other planet reflects me back. I am the Earth. So this looks at the constitution of your planetary body. It has layers. It's not like a human being. It's built on another pattern. But every layer, it's different. But there's a vertical movement. Things break down. The energy comes from the sun, is digested, is absorbed by Earth, is processed by humanity, eaten by a human being, but then is uh, metabolized by the cells or whatever. The life of the whole thing is vertical. And the other way around, it builds back up in your actions, affect humanity, affect life, affect the planet. This is the real life, is this vertical. Where are you looking from? Is that, is that a real picture? Yes. Wow. One of the things was that Douglas also says it's the Earth becoming aware of itself. Mm. It yes. Awareness, awareness is not in one spot, is it? No. <laughs> That's the view the other way, right? Mm -hmm. This is a mutual observers. Each is in the other. It's a rather beautiful relationship, isn't it? It's beautiful. Okay, so you're looking at the moon. Are you a person looking at the moon? Or are you the planet looking at the moon? Mm -hmm. When you look at another person, you use two eyes. Mm -hmm. And your two eyes are this far apart, so they can focus on this range. To focus further, you need ob observers further apart. Otherwise, you can't get the angle on it to get a distance. The eyes, the observatories you've got, are on each side of the planet. You've got to know how far apart your observatories are in order, and know the angle. Then you can calculate the distance of the moon. So these are your planetary eyes. You've grown them over the last century. This is another in your planetary community, family. Do you know his name? Saturn. Saturn. Saturn is in you. This is not your human mind. This is your planetary level of thinking, really. Now here's the relative size. Which one do you identify with? But one is in the other, the other is in the one. Okay, so, now we're going up the hierarchy. And Douglas says, uh, oh, I need to know who I am. I've got, I can't stop. Tell me who I am from further away. I, why stop anywhere? What, why limit the view? This is the solar system. This is the planet Earth. And there's the sun. Now, if you know what the solar system looks like, we're a planet going around the sun. There's others, right? Like, going around. So now, if you can imagine... There's a place somewhere out there beyond this system. So you're getting a sense of here 
and there. Do you understand? Mm. My here is Richard and my there is you guys. But my here and there expands. I now uh, turn and think about Bristol and my here has expanded to Salisbury. Mm. And now it's included all you guys. But now I look over the channel at France and my here has expanded to England because my there has grown mm. to France. Now I look further uh, out to the sun and my here is the earth. Here and there are elastic relative. Now if I now make my here the whole of this system, the sun and the planets, the there is other systems. There's a vast difference between this one and those. Now as you rise up the hierarchy, this is the mystic's journey towards wholeness, <laughs> towards the whole. And typically in the mystical journey there is much talk at a certain uh, stage of fire and light and heat. This is this physical journey where we are now in the region of the light. We are all one in the sun. We are all one in that body. It's a body of light in a way. So now we are on this star looking out at the other stars. Your here isn't just this planet. To grow, it's this thing where, you, you know, I'm a person, you're a person, but come up to me, I'm not a person, I'm room for you. I'm a star and you're stars, but I am also not a star. I am empty for you guys. We're now in a so solar community. And let's say, from out there you look like this. You are this. This is your here. This is your body. Amongst all these other star bodies. And at this level, you have now got new eyes. Because you're looking further, you've got to get your eyes further apart. So your observatories on the Earth take a picture of the star in spring and in autumn, six months apart. Do you understand it? You're going around, you take a photo when you're on this side of the sun, you take a photo on that side. So you've got to, you know, take into account it's a different time, but now you've got an angle. It's only as this whole system that you can calculate the distance of another star. Richard, yeah. that doesn't make a difference in how I perceive the star. Does, does it make a difference? It doesn't make a difference to know how far it is. Well, it is means that you're seeing the star, so we're thinking about it, with this star. You can't see that star just as a person. You need the whole of this system to see that system. And you, see, and you need that, that parallax view to project the star to where it really yes. is. If you look with your two human eyes, you see a dot in the sky. If you look with these eyes, you can tell how big it is, how far it is away. You can start to observe it and know, you know what kind of star it is. That's a star seeing another star. A human seeing a star is a dot in the sky. Okay. All right? Another amazing thing, when you actually come to think about it, is when we're looking... So we're, we're, we're here, and we're looking at a star, so the star is observing us as a star. Yes. Actually, if we actually were physically going to that star and stood, were able to stand on it, it would be a rock, so it wouldn't be light. That's right, yes. You've gone up to it. Yeah. Go so up to anything and you lose it. What I'm saying is that the property of it, from this distance, is, is totally different. Yes. It would be if we were actually there. Yes, absolutely. And that's also, and the other side of the way around. Yes. So Exactly, that's mutual observers. Yes. All right, here's a local scene. <laughs> I bet they knew about this in their own way, you know? Now we're looking from this star at the other stars, but this is uh, now seeing part of the Milky Way. Uh, well, we're always seeing the Milky Way in the stars, but it's seeing one of the arms of the Milky Way, which is like a swastika, like a spiral. And so now we're getting not just a sense of the stars, but beginning to get a feeling for our galactic body. Now we're still within the galaxy. But now if you look beyond this galaxy, you see other galaxies. This is called the Sombrero gal Galaxy. Isn't that gorgeous? Yeah, wow. This is a galaxy full of billions and billions of solar systems. Oh, there's billions and billions. We're so far away, they've merged, you see, into one being, into one self. If we go up to it, it would break apart 
and become billions of solar systems, stars. Now from there, if you imagine, we can never get far enough away actually with a spacecraft to see what we look like. But we, just, just as you work out what you look like, we can work out what we look like mm -hmm. because we know enough about what we can see mm -hmm. and how we work, you see. So, <coughs> this is the kind of galaxy that we are. This is not us. We never had a photograph of us, but we're a, like a Catherine wheel. Mm -hmm. And so that line in the sky is as if you're here looking out through one of these layers, right? One of these arms. We're about some in the equivalent, we're about somewhere here, I think. Or we might be looking in. Now we're looking out through one of those spiral arms. Now you've only got to use your imagination a bit. All these dots are stars within this galaxy. But you only got to imagine if you look further, you look beyond this body towards one of those other galaxies. Your hair has now grown to galactic proportions. Yeah. Okay, so they took a camera and they focused it in a tiny bit of sky and left it for 90 days or something. Wow. And they came up with that tiny bit of sky which was full of just countless galaxies. Got we are sense. one galaxy in countless. These are our friends. Yeah. These are our neighbors. These are our mutual observers. This is the law of equality. Their galaxies in this center, our galaxy will be being viewed from there. We will probably have a name. <laughs> Intuitively, we've known we were a galaxy. The swastika is a very old symbol. Or the Tai Chi symbol. One of the oldest symbols. How did they come up with it? Well, that's for lots of reasons, but, you know, it, it makes sense also. That the, because we are the galaxy. It's like never knowing you're a human being and dreaming you were. Okay, so this journey of mutual observers, we're trying to find out who, you, who we are. So we're moving back and back, but it's a never-ending journey. If you want to find the whole of yourself, how can you get far enough away to see the whole of yourself? Because you need your observer. And in fact, the further apart, the bigger the observer is. So you even know less in a way about yourself. So, if you move away and, uh, you know, the galaxy includes other galaxies and a cluster of galaxies, and eventually, you could say at some point, perhaps, it just fades over the cosmic horizon. Now, they do draw diagrams of the whole universe. <laughs> I mean, who is looking? Another universe? <laughs> they are careful to call it the observable universe. Oh, okay. All right. But anyway, you get the idea. Okay, so Douglas says your attempt at knowledge of yourself is doomed to fail because you can never get far enough away to see the whole of yourself. The only thing to do is to return back to the center. As you go back to the center, you peel off all these things. You move closer, you leave behind, you give away your galactic body, you give away your solar body, you give away your human, eventually you give away everything till you get to the nothing. This is when the mystic Praying for the beatific vision of wholeness hits the desert and can't find it. Everything falls apart. You're just about there, you're just in that peak experience, it all fades and you're left with nothing. It's a classic dark night of the soul. At that point, turn around and go all the way back down to nothing. Turn around again and you are now the vehicle for the whole that you can never be. Does that make sense? Mm. Your capacity now. The only way to be everything is to be nothing. And there's a huge difference about this. Because as you're going away, in a way your ego is expanding. Mm. Right? Mm. I'm the Earth now. Oh, I'm the star. I'm the galaxy. It feels really great. 
When you return and come to the nothingness and surrender everything and turn around in a capacity for the whole, the whole now is not you, it's other. And it has this profound uh, mystery about it. It's totally other. This is a very deep journey of the hierarchy, the spiritual journey. And honestly, you're about a third of the way through the hierarchy. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going, you know, we're, we're limiting ourselves here. I'm just going to go back to something about distance and depth. So it's such a fundamental thing. When you reflect everything here, you then project it out. But there's this mysterious thing of depth, right? Mm. I mean, it's here, but it's there. What is this depth? Height and width are given, but not depth. You can measure between any two objects, but if you turn your ruler to measure between them and you, there's no gap. Pure depth. Very mysterious. Non-dimensional, immeasurable. Now there's something about depth that Douglas points out. <clears throat> about distance. This sense of distance of the world that you're looking at, that's given here yet there, it feels other. And then he attributes other qualities to it. it has a sense of holiness, transcendent constancy. It's always there. And remoteness conveys majesty. If you are a king and you want to get a bit of mystique, have a long room with you at the far end. <laughs> You come in and, whoa, wow. <laughs> uh -huh. Something close is different. This is the law of elsewhereness again. Even that sense of otherness is here. It's here and there. Mystery. Okay. I'd like to go on about 10 minutes. Is that all right? Yeah. Like, there's a, another thing that's, that Douglas pointed out, which, which, which just steps back to near the beginning of the book, but which would just be fun to see if you can, I can communicate it, which is how you see. All right, so this is the kind of basic idea of how you see, right? A light comes on to another person, is directed into your eyes, turned upside down, transmitted through cells or whatever into the back of your brain where you then have an idea of someone, they say. All right? That's the idea. Douglas could never quite believe that one. <laughs> he says, yeah, I do see you here, but not in my head, in my no-head, right? That's the, direct, that's the experiment. And it's not an idea of you, it's the real you. Mm. So, if we go back to this one, it's not wrong, but there's not a way of interpreting it. Because this is a flat piece of paper on which this is drawn, but how you get this information is by moving closer. In other words, you, there's an observer observing this process. It starts in the sun, but is transfigured, transformed by the planetary atmosphere, which processes it, which comes you know, to the, the human. And then the observer's moving in to see what happens. Okay, so then uh, the eyes are affected and then the molecules are affected or whatever. You know, get closer and closer. Well, you're moving in towards the center of someone. When someone does that journey, say, they're actually coming in and noting what happens. So they're coming to where the experience is, but it's, they leave the brain behind and move even closer towards the center. So it's a vertical thing, not a horizontal. When you, again, you get to the centre, you turn around and that person's come with you. This makes sense of the scientific information we've got, reinterpreting. So, when I appear in you, I've been on a long journey. I started out as nothing, a little bit away. If you intercepted my message to you at a closer distance, you would find I was electrons. Step back and intercept this broadcast further away. I'm a man. Further away on the planet. It's a broadcast from nothing to nothing. So, I build up from nothing, I evolve. 
I recapitulate the story of evolution. Just as I look at you, I evolved through all these primitive layers, through cellular cells to a person, and you. At the same time, you do the same to me. And Douglas is pointing out, you can't have it one way. It's two way. When I'm arriving in you, you're arriving in me. I have a brain, but it's somewhere out there in the brain surgeon. It's not here. I don't see with my brain, but I need my brain to see. I need every layer of my body to see you. So in other words, I see what is here, you, with what is there, my brain and my body, right? Because my body is in you. I need that body in you to see you. That's what he says in the small hierarchy. See if you can get this one. In the big hierarchy, he's so full of humour. In the small hierarchies, do you understand that? I see what is here, you, with what is there, my body and you, right? I can't see you if I don't have a body, but where is my body? It's in you. All right, so I see what is here with what is there. In the big hierarchy, he says, I see what is not there, because you're here, with what is not here. Because my body's there. I see what is not there with what is not here. <laughs> it's so funny. Okay, so seeing another person, you know, each other means I'm occupied by you, you're occupied by me. It's a two-way thing. There's a medieval idea. The beam, the, the beam of your eye is an active thing going out. Seeing is not just one way. We think it is, but it's not. It's two ways. You arrive in me, I arrive in you. So experience is both passive and active. Stimulus and response. This is the vertical thing. So the sun affects the planet, which affects the life. Which, this is the incoming stimulus, all the way to the centre. And my reaction goes from the centre out through all the layers. It's two way. Okay, so then, just a little bit very briefly on time. When a, you look at a star, it arrives in you and you project it back. Okay? But it's come from, say, 20,000 years ago. So it's not just here from there, it's now from then. So, as, as it were, whenever you look out, you're looking into the past. But the past is now. And that's because of the speed of light. That's because it takes the light. It takes see. that long to get yes. there. That's right. If you look further, you see it takes longer. Mm -hmm. So do, your world is projected in space and time. You're surrounded by time zones at the center because there's no projection, no distance, there's no time. Here now is timeless, but contains there then. Okay, so this is, we're coming to the end here. Just want to give you a taste of the time thing. Because it's two-way. So, you're looking out, the star or the galaxy arrives here. So that's the incoming message. Right? I look at the star, it's taken 20,000 years to get here, now from then. I'm receiving your appearance from a fraction of a second ago. In response, my uh, appearance goes out to you. So from my point of view, you have arrived in me, and I will arrive in you. Mm. It's like reading a letter from a friend uh, who wrote two days ago, and, and you're reading what happened then, and you're thinking about what your letter will be, what you're going to write to them, so they will receive your letter in two days. You have a good sense of what their future will be. Mm. And when you project yourself there into what their future will be, you can look back and see what your future is in a general sense. And the distance that you look increases the past and the future. Mm. All right. Bravo. In summary, well, it's all, it's all right here. <laughs> yeah. That's the take home. Exactly. That's the very short version. <laughs> and, uh, I recall, and I'm sure Catherine will recall, 
a visitor who came to Napton to see Douglas and Catherine uh, when Douglas was an old man and he wanted to discuss the hierarchy which he was reading mm -hmm. and he asked many questions and after one question Douglas turned to him and said ask Richard <laughs> 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 That's what he, when I was translating the short to a hierarchy and some I couldn't understand some things. And then I went to him and I said, what did you mean? He said, I just don't know, I don't remember, ask Richard. <laughs> so one final thing or two. Uh, uh, at the very end of the hierarchy, Lucas says, if, if this book quenches the flame of wonder in anyone, it would be better I didn't yes. write it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And uh, the other thing uh, was when um, we published it again, in, in, published it in hardback in 1999 or something, he wrote a little preface. And he quoted someone else, he said, When I wrote this, both I and God knew what it was about. <laughs> now only God knows. <laughs> <laughs> Well, a real pleasure to share this very great book with you. Oh, yeah. Yeah.